Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Coffee and Chat series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Litsa Christodoulou, and I'm a partner in the Business Services Division of HLB Man Judd here in Perth. I'm very excited to welcome you to the WA Economic Update webinar presented by Bank West Chief Economist, Alan Langford. Good afternoon, Alan. Hi, Litsa. How are you? Good to be with you. Thanks. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know, Alan is an economist for Bank West for over 25 years advising Bank West and its clients on the implication of economic and financial market trends. He publishes regular Bank West economic updates in line with key events and interest and in exchange rate movements and regularly presents to, in to industries. We're very lucky to have Alan here present to us today because Alan is retiring at the end of the financial year next year. For all of those people who missed it, in, in uh, today's West, Australia Magazine, The Insider, um, Alan's provided some interesting in, insight into the world of an economist. In today's session, Alan will give us an assessment on how COVID-19 has impacted WA's economy so far, and what will underpin the early or vigorous recovery from the devastating impact of the pandemic. Just for the attendees, if you have any questions during the webinar, please send them through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And our marketing manager, who's working in the background, Richard Colorti, would read them at the end of the session to Alan and um, hopefully Alan will be able to answer. Richard is also um, assisting Alan in, in um, the slide presentation. I'm now going to disappear from your screens. Uh, I'll be back after Alan uh, gives his talk. Um, so looking forward to it, Alan, so over to you. Great, thanks, Litza. <clears throat> yeah, it's hard to know where to start, but um, it's not, actually it's not that difficult. It's the labour market, but just before I do, what I'm going to do is sort of refer to a couple of recent papers that we've done. It's uh, talked about the um, economic updates we do. One of them quite recently was posing the question or a stock check of how COVID-19 has affected the WA economy so far and posing the question whether the mining industry might be able to underpin an early and vigorous re recovery from COVID. Uh, a lot of that will depend on the iron ore price, which I'll, will be one of my latest slides. Uh, but equally overarching this, of course, is the, the ongoing success in maintaining the pandemic. And we're seeing a stark reminder of how uh, it can seemingly be under control and talking about Melbourne uh, and then a bit of an outbreak comes through and even in cities, big densely populated cities like Seoul and Tokyo, which have been much more successful than say London and New York in containing COVID uh, are now starting to see some, a little bit of a second wave. So uh, that's overarching all of this, but um, uh, I'm not a medical doctor and unlike Donald Trump, I ne they therefore don't give uh, medical advice. Uh, so a lot of it depends on that, but what I want to start with, uh, Richard, for uh, slide two, please, is the looking at the labour market. Now, the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, have uh, augmented their long-standing uh, economic data with some more timely and more frequent data, and particularly on the labour market, which is where all the action is, uh, what we call the payroll indices. Now, uh, so as opposed to the labour force survey, which I'll come to in a couple of slides time, these payroll indices are done in conjunction with the Australian tax office through the single touch uh, payroll system. Uh, it covers virtually all large businesses and about 80% of small businesses. So it's a pretty good uh, and timely uh, indicator of the havoc that has been wrought by COVID-19, particularly the lockdown of certain key parts of the economy to contain a spread. So what I've got there in that first chart, uh, the, what it does tell us is that female employment has been more heavily impacted than male employment and young compared to uh, not so young, particularly the under 20. By any stretch of the imagination, there's been a precipitous decline in uh, employment in the under 20 but, and also the 20 to 29. Now they've uh, rebounded and I use that sort of term in inverted commas a little bit since uh, the 25th of April, or week ending the 25th of April, was, uh, was when things troughed, particularly in the under 20. Uh, but clearly, it's only uh, partially unwound the significant um, decline in payrolls in point, uh, point employment. Uh, 
So uh, next uh, chart, please, Richard. Uh, now, by industry, uh, it's hardly surprising that the accommodation and food services and the arts and recreation, those two uh, parts of the economy that had to be shuttered very quickly to contain the spread of COVID uh, versus, say, construction and particularly health and social assistance. That's, of course, ticked up a bit because um, that's at the front line of the containment of COVID. Now, the interesting one from WA particularly is mining. Uh, now that has fallen nothing like a, the discretionary ones, but to a fairly significant, or to a not insignificant extent, and because it's a highly paid, generally highly paid and overwhelmingly full-time employment industry, uh, in terms of the uh, impact on total wages, while WA has been not as badly affected as other states in terms of the actual payroll numbers, in terms of the total fall in the aggregate payroll, it has been uh, significantly worse. Now, so that next slide, please, Richard, does in fact show WA versus the rest of Australia. I'll just talk, so the yellow line there is WA, and you can see we didn't fall quite as far, and we're still ahead of all other states um, in terms of payrolls, in terms of the slight rebound, but still a very steep decline, and it's only unwound some of it. And I probably should have put the total payroll, value of payroll in, in this, but uh, whereas WA is better than other states in terms of total payroll because of the mining sector, the job losses in mining, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the downturn in payrolls has actually been worse in WA than any other state. <clears throat> so clearly, uh, you know, as I say, this is the payroll data. Um, this is the new data from ATO, um, single touch payroll system, but then there's also the long standing since 1978 uh, labour force survey, which is monthly, and rather than on jobs, it focuses on people. So uh, if we could just go to the next slide, please. Um, Richard, so this is total employed persons, uh, WA on the left scale, and this is in million persons, and Australia, sorry, the rest of Australia on the right scale. So pretty much, sort of, WA is a little bit obscured. You can just see the yellow line behind the blue line there. I played around with the scales on this a bit to sort of try and make it that, but you know, that's sort of, you've heard, all heard of lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, there's lots of things we can do. Uh, when people say something's off the scale, or well, we economists just say that's okay, we just change the scale so it's back on the scale. Uh, but basically employment is in the space of two months in April and May has got, in WA has gone back to where it was in late 2011. So effectively lost nine years worth of employment in the space of two months. Such is the severity of the downturn. Compare that with the recession of the early 90s, where it was very gentle and not nearly as big in peak to trough terms. This is a significant uh, shock to the economy, including the WA economy especially. Now, <clears throat> I, um, and the one thing that really has out is the next one is an extremely stark one. So if you could just go to slide six, please, Richard. Uh, the, um, now, this is the, at the national level. We don't have seasonally adjusted employment by age at the state level. We do have non-seasonally adjusted, and when you look at total annual growth, um, so in other words, what it is now in May compared to what it was a year ago, uh, there's nothing to suggest that WA is any less shocking in terms of its um, impact on young people. The 15 to 24 year uh, age bracket has just fallen off a cliff, uh, an astonishing um, decline. Now, to be perfectly honest, there's nothing, well, it is, this is even bigger, but. Uh, the young people always sort of take the brunt compared to the rest of the 25 plus in terms of uh, the effect of downturn. You can see the recession there of the early 90s. Uh, the GFC was much more heavily concentrated in young people. Um, but particularly at the moment, because young people are overrepresented over in those, the hospitality industry, which of course are the ones that are most affected by COVID-19. So that's a pretty stark picture by any stretch of the imagination. Now, the reason I have not put in uh, the unemployment rate, uh, and I did a paper just uh, late last week uh, explaining, because you might have heard a lot of publicity, the fact that WA has once again got the highest unemployment rate and it's been a very steep 
rise in the jobless rate. Uh, that's a little bit one of the quirks of the labour force survey. Uh, if someone uh, loses their job, to be counted as unemployed, they need to be looking actively looking for work. Well, it would be quite absurd for someone, you know, a, a person uh, in serving in a, a hospitality in the hospitality sector to be looking for work to have been looking for work in April or May uh, when their industry shut it down and all other businesses in the same industry. So. Uh, what, what that means is that if people drop out of the labour market, they're not counted as unemployed. But the employment problem showing there on that slide six uh, is not affected by that. That's actually people that have lost their jobs since the shutdowns. Um, and the, it turns out that a higher proportion of um, people in WA, for whatever reason, have stayed in the labour force and are therefore counted as unemployed. So very misleading in terms of the, uh, uh, the fact that WA's unemployment rate has risen more steeply than others. Just for starters, WA has always had the highest um, participation rate in Australia. Uh, so that sort of puts a, an, a, an upward bias to our unemployment rate in times of labour market stress, and we are certainly in that at the moment. Uh, the biggest stress since the depression of the 1930s, for sure. Um, so employment is the one, but particularly when we go to the next slide, this one, indices of hours worked. Uh, I've just indexed this again, Australia, the rest of Australia, the blue line, WA, the yellow line. Now, uh, there's very steep fall and there is an uptick in uh, season adjusted hours worked or there was an uptick in May. Now, that may be nothing more than the normal month to month volatility in the labour force survey, particularly in a one of the more less populated states, WA compared to say New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, but um, the peak to trough, um, we're down by eight, 8.8% versus more than 10% in the rest of Australia. I think that's a truer picture of the relativities between WA and the rest of Australia. Our labour market is a little less in terms of actual numbers, is a little less impacted. As I say, in terms of total wages, that's a different matter. Uh, but uh, we're a little less affected, but still like the rest of Australia, all parts of the economy have been badly impacted as was always be, going to be the case. You just can't shutter uh, you know, a significant portion of the economy, quite rightly so, to, uh, to contain the spread of the pandemic. You can't shutter that and not expect it to have um, a, a significant impact. So a lot of that, uh, so I've talked about the labour market. I mean, I make no apologies for talking lots about the labour market in the first part of this webinar because it's the biggest game in town. There has been a devastating impact uh, much more devastating the recession of the early 90s uh, on the labour market from the pandemic. Uh, yes, to some extent, particularly in WA, as we can sort of reopen our economy to some extent uh, from, you know, as uh, restrictions are lifted, we're told that the Derby is going to have 60,000 people down at the stadium uh, in the middle of next month. Um, you know, that's clearly a, um, a case, I guess, for... Um, one of the, you know, we've always talked about the tyranny of distance in WA, that isolation has been a problem for us over the years, but clearly it has been a virtue in containing COVID uh, in, in recent times. I mean, in Australia generally, you know, we're a great big island and we've done very well. I mean, a lot, very good management compared to some other, uh, some other economies, both, um, you know, advanced and non-advanced economies, but particularly advanced economies, the UK and US uh, clearly have had significant issues. But even Canada, um, which is a sort of an economy, I mean, you can't say that the issue of a non-public um, health, the absence of a public health system is an issue in Canada, and yet they've had more than 8,000 deaths. That's in a, in, a, in a country of 38 million people compared to, you know, a little over 100 in Australia with an, a population of 25 million. So we've done very well compared to Canada uh, and certainly compared to the US and UK. I've got to say I've been very uh, impressed by how the national cabinet system has worked. Um, you know, the, the PM plus the state and territory premiers and chief ministers uh, across the political divide, obviously the states are a mixture of 
coalition and Labor <coughs> uh, governments, and they've all worked uh, pretty well, notwithstanding, you know, issues, the, the pressure on the WA Premier to reopen the borders compared to what's happening in the US. Um, it's just chalk and cheese. We've done very well. But equally in the UK, where they don't have a state, you know, they don't have state government versus uh, centralised government, and clearly they've been found wanting as well. Okay, so to bring it now to more WA, as I say, what might uh, drive it, and the big one is, you know, will the mining industry underpin an early and vigorous recovery? Uh, a lot of that depends on what happens in iron ore, which is the next slide, please, Richard. Okay, uh, the iron, US dollar iron ore prices, um, by any, this is why I call it a once in a multi-generational boom, commodity price boom, particularly for WA. Uh, Australia is by far the biggest exporter of iron ore in the world and that almost all of that comes from WA. I had to make a, uh, a, an apology to our friends in South Australia a few years ago when I said that all exports of iron ore came from WA. There is a, a few hundred million worth goes from South Australia, uh, but overwhelmingly it's from WA and overwhelmingly of course from the Pilbara. So um, really enough prices went very little for a long period <clears throat> until uh, the middle of the last decade, the middle of the, uh, sorry, the decade before last now, sorry, just gone over, the middle of the 2000s um, when China, demand from China really started to take off. Uh, look, this is a classic um, uh, case of the, uh, <clears throat> for those of you without wanting to um, sort of trigger any acid reflux from those of you that may have had to sit through Economics 101 in your tertiary studies, uh, a classic case of you know, an outward shift in the demand curve. That was the China's sudden um, ramping up in their steel intensive industrial infrastructure spending uh, such that, and a say outward shift in the demand curve, but then equally your economics lecture would have said in a contestable market, and after all this is iron ore, it's not exactly a, a rare commodity, there's lots of it, uh, then there will be an outward shift in the supply curve, and uh, when that happens, of course the price is going to come down just as quickly as it went up, and that's what that yellow line there. There's a bit of a, because we used to have up until sort of about the late 2000s, it was very much a pricing system was very much by negotiation, you know, the big uh, producers um, in Australia and uh, Brazil would get together with the big customers, which initially was uh, Japan, now very much China, and sit down and thrash out a, a negotiated price which would last for the year. That's all gone by the wayside now, whereas most of it is priced in the spot market, so that's that yellow line there. Now, uh, the dotted line is the WA budget, their mid-year review forecast, which is back in December last year. They were not expecting the um, flurry in the iron ore price to last, and we'll explain uh, that a bit more. Uh, the inset there is the monthly average spot price in peak in July uh, last year. Now, <coughs> um, look, uh, very much this is to do with the uh, firstly, there was a tailing stand disaster in Brazil in January last year, and they were just on the verge of sort of recovering from that, which next chart, please, Richard. Uh, that the um, pink inset there is the Brazil's export volumes. They had the tailing stand disaster in early 2019, and of course their production fell and their exports fell very, uh, precipitously and funnily enough the price went up um, because you take out a big uh, chunk of supply the second biggest exporter in the world after Australia read WA uh, the price is going to go up another thing that your economics lecturer would have uh, would have told you but as that supply started to come back on stream in sort of um, from April last year April May last year then so with a lag the price came down again um, then sort of went sideways at between $85 and $95 a tonne, that's the yellow line there. But then when uh, COVID started to really hit the Brazil's um, uh, iron ore capacity, um, because Brazil are led by someone even less convinced that uh, COVID is a problem than Donald Trump is, uh, that's hit the capacities for Brazil. Basically, they've uh, dropped back again, and so the price has gone 
up significantly. Now, uh, as and when Brazil comes back in, the price will come back down again, and that was um, fairness to the full marks to the state government for not assuming that it would stay where it is. Uh, but when they did that in December, they didn't know that COVID was going to intervene. So it has held up a lot better. Now that's really important to the WA economy, but very important to the state government because for every one US dollar increase in the um, spot iron ore price, uh, it means about 85 million Australian dollars to the state government's bottom line. If, if it's just, this is the, the year average price. So it's a big deal. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so uh, what's been bad for Brazil in part, well, significantly because of their own issues. Firstly, they clearly didn't have their uh, structural integrity of their tailing stamps uh, particularly uh, right. And of course, they've also been hammered significantly by COVID. So another example of where, um, you know, if you can get a pandemic uh, under control, it is a significant benefit to your economy. Um, so look, the iron ore, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, obviously very much will be driven by demand from China, uh, but also particularly in terms of how quickly Brazil can get back to full production. And it's clearly not imminent because it's got a problem with COVID and they still need to fix their tailing stamp, issue, tailing stamp issues. Uh, obviously the state government and we as WA economy will, will take it while we can, but we need to recognise um, that this is an issue. And it also just highlights how exposed the WA economy is to exports of a single commodity to a single market being iron ore to China. Now China is not going to shoot itself in the foot by uh, restricting Australia's iron ore exports until Brazil comes back online and that's still some time. But it's not that difficult to imagine, sort of envisage, you know, uh, when Brazil does come back on, it might be a year, might be two, might be three years, but as and when it does, if China, for instance, ramps up the proportion of its steel production that it does from uh, using scrap steel in electric arc furnaces, rather than um, metallurgical coal and iron ore in blast furnaces, uh, that the, the price sort of coming down, coming under some fairly significant pressure because um, for every ton of steel that's made by using scrap by an electric arc furnace rather than a blast furnace, it displaces 1.4 tons of iron ore. Now at the moment, China only, uh, sorry, recycled steel <coughs> only accounts for about 9% of China's um, steel capacity, uh, but uh, the DIS, the Department of Industry and Innovation and Sciences, reckon that sort of go, might go to sort of 15% uh, within the next two or three years. Uh, and particularly, of course, China's got lots of steel in all those buildings that it sort of constructed 20 years ago, and lots of um, vehicles as well that are constructed in the last sort of even 10 years. And as and when they do that, either to sort of try and reduce their reliance on exports of iron ore from Australia, <coughs> excuse me, and or to deal with uh, pollution issues. Uh, as I say, we, we, we probably need to start thinking now during the good times about how we wean ourselves off that reliance on iron ore. It's been very good for us, very good for the state government, and very good for the broader WA economy, but it is an exposure nevertheless. And the uh, second biggest one, second biggest exposure is to LNG exports. Next chart, please, Richard. LNG liquefied natural gas, uh, a very big export, um, second only to iron ore in terms of its importance to the WI economy. So what I've got here is um, notional Australian, this is in US dollar now. So I'll come to the Australian dollar a little bit later. Uh, notional X LNG export prices in tons uh, per ton on the right chart, that's the uh, right scale, that's the yellow line versus the uh, benchmark oil price. In this case, because the long time series is West Texas Intermediate, uh, but it's a similar picture if you talk about the Brent um, benchmark oil price as well. And that's because while most of our LNG exports are on long-term contracts, those contracts are uh, move up or down with the oil price traditionally. Um, so when the oil price collapsed during the GFC, uh, LNG prices came down with it. And when they both rebounded at the same time, 
And uh, then I think in the next chart, I'm not ready yet, sorry, uh, in a few charts time, I will be looking at why um, there's been this precipitous decline in oil and gas prices, what it was in the middle of last decade. Uh, so we cannot ignore what's happening with the oil price. And we can't also ignore that increasingly uh, the importance of spot LNG cargoes. So the green inset there is the spot price. It was sort of 5.5 um, US dollars per million, that's million British thermal uh, unit. Uh, and that was five and a half dollars at the beginning of this year. It's now is sort of struggling to get even back to two and a half. So spot LNG prices. Now, part of that is because the world is awash with LNG as the US starts to uh, ramp up exports of it. Uh, and, but also it was a mild Northern hemisphere winter last winter and throwing COVID as well. And it's been the perfect storm for spot LNG prices. And what this does is severely dense the, the case for Woodside to, and its various partners to bring uh, gas from their Scarborough and Browsefields down back to the Northwest Shelf to, for their aspiration to create a borough pub uh, in terms of LNG. Um, there was already, even before COVID, there were already issues there with the various partners having different different um, sort of agendas and time frames for bringing that down. But COVID has certainly um, been an issue with that as well. Now we'll come back to that a little bit, um, but the uh, next one, the Brent oil price. Um, next chart, please, Richard. Yeah, now uh, I showed that longer one, previous one was West Texas, but the Brent one is actually the one that determines uh, royalties. Um, the WA budget is also sensitive to the tune of 12, million Australian dollars for every one dollar per barrel change in the Brent oil price. So that's relatively small compared to iron ore, uh, but still nevertheless very significant. And the reason that's um, relevant is because while normally most um, offshore oil and gas revenues or tax revenues generally go to Canberra and certainly for Gorgon and for um, Prelude and for Ictus, they all will, but for the Northwest Shelf, it's a different because somehow Charles Court, when he was Premier in the late 1970s, managed to get Malcolm Fraser as the Prime Minister at the time and John Howard as his Treasurer to give WA two thirds of the tax revenues from the Northwest Shelf for the life of that project. And that's still a very important project. I'm not sure that either of them would have assumed, or certainly other state Premiers would have assumed that 40 years later, four zero years later, WA would still be uh, deriving um, significant revenues from that. It peaked for, in 2014 at 1.2 billion. Uh, this year, because of the lower oil price, it's more like, it'll be more like 500 million, but still very significant, still more than just petty cash, very relevant to the WA economy. So we're very interested in what happens to the oil price. It collapsed, yes, it's made a bit of a rebound, but it's still much lower than it was um, before it collapsed uh, late last year. Um, and what that's also done, next slide please, Richard, is it has caused petroleum exploration, this is just WA, to fall off a very high cliff. Uh, when and it's this, the other issue, you know, there's old supply and demand stuff, when the, when the price goes up, it's uh, particularly in uh, minerals, <laughs> It uh, <clears throat> triggers a frenzy of exploration, but equally when it goes down, the, the sort of rewards for finding new petroleum clearly is not what it was when, oil, when the oil price was $100 a barrel. And so petroleum exploration is very, very subdued, as you would expect, but albeit from a very, very high cliff. <clears throat> now I wanna come back to the next one, the um, relationship between oil and gas prices. Next slide, please. Now this is, uh, what we've got here is the yellow line there, red to the left chart is the West Texas Intermediate Oil um, price. And the right one is the US Henry Hub gas prices. Now they've always used to move up and traditionally moved up and down with each other because there's sort of energy, substitute, energy substitutes. Uh, but that all changed in the recovery in the price from the GFC. So they both collapsed precipitously. Then when the oil price 
recovered quickly post GFC, the gas price didn't. And that is because in the late 2000s, uh, so around about 2007, 2008, the fracking revolution in the US uh, came to uh, the gas industry. It all started literally deep in the heart of Texas, but there are actually minor fields compared to some of the ones under Pennsylvania and even in some in New York State. Uh, that, so that fracking revolution, uh, a big increase in supply, so that held the price of gas down, even when the oil price uh, rose. But in 2014, the fracking revolution went from the gas, was uh, translated to gas to the oil industry, and that's why that precipitous decline in the oil price from 2014. <clears throat> now, that's been relevant, that's very relevant to WA because uh, before the fracking industry came to the gas industry, so until about, certainly until the mid 2000s, but probably until about 2008, it was just assumed, taken as read, that by now, 2020, the US would be a big importer of LNG, the liquefied natural gas. Well, that's, now it's not, uh, though all those um, receivable terminals that it built have now been retrofitted into export terminals, and it's been a real game changer for the uh, LNG exporters such that um, not only are there uh, legacy uh, contracts tied to the oil price, but equally the big customers in be it Korea, Japan, um, to some extent China itself, uh, are saying, well, unless you sharpen your pencils, we will um, take advantage, thank you very much, that the US is now uh, going to be uh, a big exporter of LNG thanks to the fracking revolution. So uh, a huge, a huge game changer. And as I say, it certainly significantly impacts the viability or the business case for Woodside and its partners to bring uh, the, as I say, Scarborough and Browse gas down to the Northwest shelf uh, for processing. And it's really, it's important to the WA government as well because part of the Browse is sort of is, is in what they call the Tarosa field in the Browse Basin, which uh, thanks to um, um, a couple of literally small rocks that are only sort of um, exposed in low tide, uh, a significant case determined that they were actually WA waters and therefore will be, um, WA will get some revenue from that. So lots riding on that, but the case for that is certainly not as good as it could be um, because of the the downturn in oil and gas prices. So they're the big two. Uh, however, <coughs> um, the luckiest state in the lucky country also has all 35 elements uh, that go to make up a lithium iron battery, which is the next chart, please. Uh, Richard, thank you. <coughs> the lithium hydroxide price. Now, <coughs> this is the sort of, um, you know, this is a big deal in terms of the uh, battery revolution. And I should have put in, and I didn't, um, but I'll refer to that. Uh, this, the, so basically what happens, spodumene is the, um, um, the very low value stuff. So down at Greenbushes, for instance, the largest lithium mine in the world, they mine spodumene, which is about, got about 3% lithium in it. Uh, that was worth 950 US dollars a ton um, until the middle of last year. It's now worth about less than about $425 a ton. <clears throat> but if you beneficiate it into lithium hydroxide, <clears throat> you get a product that's worth about 10,000 US dollars a ton. Admittedly, that's half what it was two years ago, uh, but that is serious value adding. So the dream it goes all the way back to the first iron ore mine from the Pilbara in the middle of, middle of 1960s to add value to WA's vast mineral wealth. Um, was on the verge of being realized to an extent uh, until um, the price of lithium hydroxide um, collapsed. Now, uh, having said that, it's still significantly higher than it was, what it was until about 2015. Now, all it wouldn't be the first time that um, there's been a lot of hype in the next big thing in the mineral industry in WA. So I suspect that part of the rise in the price in six, 2016 and 17, the late 17 was, um, you know, way too much um, enthusiasm. And of course you've got lots of increase in particularly spodumene, but also in lithium, 
not so much lithium hydroxide, that's coming later. Uh, and as that sort of um, has been pushed back a bit, uh, in part because of COVID, but it was happening long before that, uh, the price came down. Now this is seriously denting, uh, the, has seriously dented the spodumene, the, uh, the miners of spodumene out in the gold fields in Pilbara have been badly hurt by that. And of course had to cut back production. And also even the, um, uh, the lithium hydroxide plant at Kwinana, um is sort of finished, but it's not yet operating in part because of the low lithium hydroxide price. Now, the green bush is an interesting little test case. Um, it is a 51% uh, Chinese company and for the other 49% is Albemarle, Chinese company is Chianchi, uh, and the US company is Albemarle. Now, Albemarle are also constructing a lithium hydroxide plant at Kemerton. Well, they've had to sort of back off it a bit. Um, but, you know, with the dynamic with WA and Australia getting, you know, caught in the crossfire of trade tensions between Washington and Beijing, um, it's an interesting little uh, sub component of that. Um, it's a little bit like China and Taiwan. I mean, they're bitter enemies, but they're still big trading partners. You know, trade speaks a lot of languages. Um, not all of them, unfortunately, but it speaks a lot of languages. And, um, you know, Greenbush has still been going along quite nicely, notwithstanding the fact that it's a 51% China, 49% US sort of joint venture. Uh, but nevertheless, significantly impacted by the um, downturn. Now, what I should have put in, what I did put in, in my paper a couple of weeks ago when I uh, asked the question whether mining would underpin an early vigorous recovery in the WA economy was that uh, put the Bloomberg New Energy Finance forecast for the demand, global demand for um, lithium ion batteries. Uh, now, while they recognise that it's been sort of um, stalled a little bit by COVID-19, it nevertheless is, uh, the outlook still is significantly um, favourable. And I would, my own opinion, I'm not a sort of um, an expert on any of this, uh, but, um, you know, I think there's a lot less risk of the lithium hydroxide price staying as low as, as it is now uh, than there is of say the iron ore price coming off fairly significantly. So, and, and the bottom line is LNG and iron ore are sort of both at the second, on the second tier of exposure, if you like, after coal and oil to um, the carbon constrained economy. Because once we get through COVID, it will become apparent that the global economy is still very carbon constrained. Whereas these guys, lithium ion batteries, uh, are at the forefront of one of the key components of solving that issue, particularly the storage of um, over, overcoming the intermittency of renewable energy, particularly wind and solar via storage. And I'm firmly of the opinion that those problems, so to speak, uh, of the intermittency of renewables are very well, over, significantly overplayed by the fossil fuel uh, industry in the first place in any case. But what that's done, uh, that big, um, the um, significant rise initially in lithium hydroxide prices, next chart please, uh, Richard, is it caused a mini boom in base metals exploration in WA, and particularly copper and, and nickel cobalt. Now, cobalt is a significant component of an electric vehicle battery, or for that matter, a, um, a stationary uh, lithium ion battery. Uh, now 50%, 50% of the global cobalt supply comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, a very troubled uh, source, the DRC. The battery makers are desperately trying to lower their um, reliance on cobalt from the DRC. And there's two ways of doing that, source cobalt elsewhere, and equally tweak, and the other way is to tweak their um, technologies, uh, which almost certainly will involve a lot more nickel uh, at the expense of cobalt. Um, and the cobalt is all overwhelmingly found in conjunction with nickel, uh, copper, and to some extent even gold, uh, but particularly copper. You can see there um, a very steep rise in copper, copper exploration. Now, both of them have come off the boil, in part because of the collapse in the lithium hydroxide price, but also some intervention early in, in the March quarter from COVID. Now I suspect the June data 
for exploration generally will be um, significantly hit by COVID. Uh, but um, as and when restrictions, as and when the, the um, explorers can get back out in the field, um, there's, I think the outlook for exploration is still uh, pretty reasonable, not for petroleum, of course, um, one I showed a couple of slides ago, um, but certainly in uh, ultimately as and when the lithium hydroxide price recovers, um, as and when, or if and when, but I'm pretty confident that it will in time, not imminent because obviously COVID is still uh, intervening in lots of supply chains, including for uh, electric vehicles. <clears throat> but there has, as I say, been a mini boom in base metals exploration because of that. Uh, next price, please. Uh, next um, <clears throat> slide, please, um, Richard. Thank you. And of course, um, <clears throat> WA is the golden state after all. The gold price um, had a good GFC when <clears throat> um, the crisis of confidence in the um, synthetic financial instruments created by the financial alchemists on Wall Street um, lost value literally overnight when um, Lehman Brothers collapsed. Um, so gold has done very well in US dollar terms. It came off the boil a bit, but it's now making a significant comeback. But in Australian dollar terms, it, it reached a succession of all time highs in March and April this year, or particularly um, late March. Now it's come off the boil a bit in part, uh, mainly because the Australian dollar has appreciated a bit more and I'll come to that shortly, uh, but still very, the gold price is still uh, very robust and it's still an important and very mature um, <clears throat> industry in WA. About 70% of Australia's gold production comes from WA. <coughs> uh, so um, we've you know, very much enjoyed uh, uh, the boom in the gold price, which has, next chart please, Richard, which has uh, caused gold to resume its normal uh, status as the biggest um, source of, of exploration in WA, uh, apart from non-petroleum exploration, obviously iron ore um, overtook, to assume that mantle for a while when the price was booming, but now, I mean, that's all been discovered and that's just sort of bowling along at around $300 million per annum, but uh, gold has recovered from 200 million to about 700 million. Now, again, it came off the board in the March quarter and the things we hear anecdotally is that that will come down again in the June quarter because of COVID. Uh, but I suspect that will sort of bounce back up again, particularly if the gold price holds up, which was that, uh, that previous chart. Uh, but it's not all WA, it's not all about mineral, uh, minerals and energy. It's also uh, about the ag sector. So next chart, please. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a pretty, um, pretty picture. Uh, this is the Western market indicator wool price. It peaked in September 2018 at almost $23 uh, um, a key sense of 2,300 cents a kilo clean. That's the way they look at it in the wool market. Uh, now it was coming down long before COVID and a lot of this was to do with, well, firstly it went too high in the first place. So the um, attractiveness of synthetics was <clears throat> as a substitute for wool and cotton. Uh, WA doesn't do much any cotton, but we're certainly a big wool producer. And you can see there uh, the price come down quite steeply, but also got caught up in the trade tensions between Washington and Beijing. Um, very much Australian wool, about 70, 70% 70 of Australia's wool goes to China. Again, uh, very exposed to that market. And it's mainly significantly used. You know, China's got its own wool for, for carpets and industrial purposes, uh, but um, for uh, high end garments, um, woolen garments, they very much use Australian wool. And of course they got caught up because of tariffs imposed by Washington on China's garments. Uh, now, and the, the market that was, price was recovering and then COVID intervened. And not only in China, but of course uh, retailers have been, um, you know, shuttered for a significant uh, clothing, um, retail trade in clothing has collapsed because of COVID. And clearly, um, I mean, people staying home, I guess you don't need new suit as often, uh, um, new fine wool suit as often, and that's very much impacted the 
the Western market indicator wool price uh, such that it's fallen by 50% uh, since its peak. And I wasn't to know at the time that the last um, physical in-person event that I will have, turns out the rule of attended as Bankwest Chief Economist was the wage in Woolarama back in early, early um, March when the price was um, 16, about $16 uh, dollars, uh, a kilo clean and now it's um, struggling to be $12. So I imagine if I went back to waging now, it would be quite a different, uh, there would be quite a different view uh, to what there was back in early March when the price, just before the price really started to come under serious COVID pressure. Um, not necessarily a lot we can do about that, obviously. Um, and, and sorry, one other thing, the, oil, the, the lower oil price has been significantly um, impacted that, that say that um, the appetite for synthetics, most of the synthetics, uh, of course, uh, require, have an oil input and because the price of oil has been low, uh, so the incentives in, in the face of very high wool prices until September 2018, as you can see there, the incentive to go to synthetics uh, at the expense of wool and cotton has been significant. So it's been almost a perfect storm um, fighting uh, against the, uh, the wool price in, um, in Australia, but particularly in WA. Okay, uh, but the big WA's biggest rural stuff is in fact uh, wheat. So the next chart, please. Um, Richard, thank you. Um, the, this is the main line there is Australia's WA's wheat harvest and the inset is barley and canola. Uh, we've had pretty good, um, with the exception of last winter, and particularly last spring, we've had uh, pretty good seasons um, between 2012 and 2019. So the financial years, that's really winter, <coughs> winters of calendar years 2011 to 18. Um, so we harvest in November and then that's sort of for the, for the following financial year. Uh, very good and sustained strong harvests in those years, but then that collapsed in 2019 harvest, which was the FY20 year, the current year that we're about to finish next um, next week. <coughs> Excuse me, same day as I retire. Um, but the dotted line there is ABARES, the Australian Bureau of Agriculture and Resource Economics and Sciences forecast for financial year 21. Now, more than anything, this is dependent on what happens in the rain. Um, now, um, I don't want to seem sort of a uh, Bureau of Meteorology geek, but um, some people, people were asking me what I'll be doing next Wednesday, my first day of retirement. I say, well, it depends on the weather. So I'll be looking, the bomb website will be my um, most famous one because while I don't mind hiking in the rain, I don't like biking in the rain. So uh, the next two months when I'm going to take a mental reset, I'll be looking at bomb and picking and choosing what days I go out uh, in hiking and biking in the hills. Um, but very much the next, certainly won't be the next few days when there's a lot of rain coming. And I would, if I was, wasn't retiring, I'd be um, getting on, to bringing on the line to our people in our agribusiness people uh, next week, just to see how much rain they get from these fronts that are coming through. There's a lot is riding in terms of whether that dotted line there comes up uh, in terms of what happens to the wheat harvest. Uh, Having said that, you've still got to get the spring finishing rains, which we did not get last year. And there's always the risk uh, of frost late in the um, season. But the blue line there I want to focus on there is barley. We've significantly increased our uh, barley production in recent years. Uh, and then along comes just last month, China imposing an 88% tariff on barley. So it effectively means, unless they reverse that decision, that there will be just no sales. It'll be, be totally unviable to make sales of barley into China. Um, Australia actually has 58 other um, markets that it sells barley into, including, um, including Saudi Arabia, uh, but it will be at much lower prices than the premium we get, in, particularly for malting barley in, in China. Um, so that is a significant issue. We'll have to accept uh, lower prices. But having said that, on just on the 5th of next month, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement 
with Australia and Indonesia comes in to force and Australia will be the only country in the world that has uh, preferential treatment or tariff gets tariff free barley sales into Indonesia. So one thing that has come out of um, not so much COVID, but the trade tensions, pre-COVID trade tensions between the US and China is that it has forced us to um, sort of crystallize our minds on getting a trade agreement with Indonesia, which after all is our closest neighbor, you know, more than 200 million people right on our doorstep. Uh, so that's one positive offset to the trade tensions between uh, the US and China, and now directly between China and Australia in terms of barley. Uh, now, um, of course, I did mention the weather. Now, this is not only because um, because I, I have my own interest in it, but uh, what's happening, the Australia's WA's grain harvest has increased over the years, particularly barley, notwithstanding the fact of the drying climate. Next chart, please, um, Richard. Now Berkshire Valley, which is effectively Mora, uh, the um, rainfall in the peak, the proper, the main growing season between May and September, uh, whichever way you look at it, is horrendous. Uh, that's the 10 year moving average, fell precipitously uh, during the 70s. It had done that during the late 50s, but it bounced right back again. Uh, then it stayed at sort of, you know, 290, 300 mils, and then took another leg down and really, really dry, whichever way you look at it. Two years ago was okay, but last year, again, particularly um, the September rainfall, and you really need that spring rainfall. Uh, this is an issue, the climate scientists always told us this would be an issue, and so it is. And next slide, um, just, Similarly, uh, in Perth, it's a little bit different because they've changed the, uh, the location of the, um, uh, where they take it. it. used to be the Perth Regional Office, <coughs> uh, and now it's uh, Mount Lawley. Um, but we do have a long, very long time series at Perth Airport. Um, incidentally, Berkshire Valley, one of that previous one, a lot of the uh, Stations have a lot of missing years. Berkshire Valley is not one of them. They have a long time series and also for Perth Airport. Uh, the, the insets there, the decade averages, <coughs> um, 1950s, 1960s, more than 800, then suddenly down to 740 and 70, 748, uh, and the most recent decade, 663, uh, the decade average, whichever way you look at it. <coughs> um, one um, slight, Bucker of the trend, if you like, is Narogen, which has actually ticked back up a little bit in recent years. But overwhelmingly, if you look at Esperance, if you look at Albany, uh, the trend of um, drying climate is overwhelming in the south, uh, southern grain growing belt of Western Australia. As I say, just exactly as the scientists have always told us. Richard, um, when we did this initial thing, there was a little clock and um, I'm a bit lost. What's the time? How long have we got? Uh, we've got about seven minutes, Alan. Seven or 17? Seven. Seven. Okay, that's great. We'll have a few more slides. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's you know, a couple of the big sort of parts of WA economy, very much a primary economy. Um, so we're reasonably confident, uh, say, of the wheat harvest sort of uh, rebounding a little bit this year. Uh, but nevertheless, we still got to recognise that we're dealing with a drying climate, which is really important. Now, um, I sit on the, uh, uh, during my time at Bank West, I've sat on the Housing Industry Forecasting Group. Uh, next slide, please, um, Richard, because this is really uh, important. The dwelling construction cycle is an important generator of employment, and it has been in the doldrums in WA uh, for a prolonged, we are in the deepest and longest uh, cyclical downturn in dwelling construction in WA since the, at least the early 1980s. <laughs> but actually, I mean, the, the, the statistics are a little bit different back in those days. Whichever way you look at it, we are in a very deep, uh, deep trough. Now, <laughs> the, so the yellow line there <clears throat> is new dwelling approvals. Uh, they peaked in 2014, middle of 2014, which incidentally is when prices peaked. Uh, and prices have come down by 15% uh, since then, but the actual dwellings, dwelling approvals have come down by 60, 60%. And there have been no less than four 
false turning points where we looked as though they bottomed and were on the uptick only to give way to another downturn such that where the trough was even deeper than the previous one. Uh, there's yet another uptick there and you see there, that's the trend estimate, the main chart and the seasonally adjusted in the <coughs> inset there for WA only. Now, uh, if not for COVID, I would have been reasonably confident this time, and I say reasonably, not totally confident, that this was not a false turning point. But then along came COVID because clearly population growth uh, is not going to be, is going to slow to a trickle. Um, the WA's population growth had been accelerating steadily um, up until the December quarter, but it was accelerating because of an increase in overseas migration, which clearly he has got, he's going to um, stop, all but stop until we can reopen the borders again to people movement. So then uh, clearly there was a significant risk that that uptick was going to be yet another false turning point. <laughs> However, of course, now the federal and state governments have come in with significant incentives. So I'd be reasonably confident that they will um, at, least in, at least bring forward uh, stuff that had come from people, households sort of uh, considering uh, committing to a new dwelling. Uh, but nevertheless, you've also got this issue of the significant shock to the labour market from COVID. So uh, there's battling some pretty strong headwinds. Um, but one thing, when you've had such a long and deep downturn in dwelling construction, it means that the oversupply that we created back in the three years to 2014 has been significantly unwound, not totally, but significantly. You know, the Perth's vacancy rate was 7.5%, 7.3%. Uh, two years ago now it's about two and a half percent. Now really that's to some extent that's because landlords have withdrawn because of low prices they've withdrawn their um, properties from the rental market rental pool and sold them which is added to downward pressure on pri established prices but there has been a genuine significant absorption of the oversupply. The problem being at the moment uh, so is of course the confidence, it's a big commitment to, uh, to commit to the construction of a dwelling uh, in the context of not knowing what quite what's going to happen in terms of your, your job security, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a huge one. Um, we're really looking to this to, to uptick um, because, and particularly the jobs that go with it, uh, because um, construction employment sort of has held up to some extent for COVID, certainly a lot better than um, accommodation, food services or arts and recreation uh, but in, and there's some obviously in, in the infrastructure spending that's going on we all know how much road work's going on around Perth at the moment that's all obviously employing people and did not grind to a halt because of COVID certainly slowed down a bit but didn't grind to a halt but we really need to see um, an uptick in uh, dwelling construction and the jobs that go with it. I'm reasonably confident that we'll get there, um, but it's not, there's no guarantee uh, in the context of a soft labour market. Now, WA is uh, along with sort of um, maybe the Canadian province of Alberta and uh, a couple of um, Persian Gulf states probably would not be a more capital intensive economy uh, on earth than WA. By that I mean the, the economy is dominated by a relatively small number of very big ticket resource projects, very, very expensive. That's what I mean by capital intensive. <coughs> so we are very interested in what happens to the cost of capital. And next chart please, uh, Richard. Um, cost of debt capital is at a historic low and will be according to the Reserve Bank for several years yet. Um, now, while I would normally in the past have shown you the cash rate or um, particularly 90 day bank bill yields, they were the benchmark for sort of the cost of, of capital, short term capital particularly, but the three year government bonds are the new 90 day bank bills. And the reason for that is because the, on the uh, 19th of March this year, the Reserve Bank announced that it was um, when it lowered the cash rate to yet another historical low of 0.25% per annum, on the same day it announced that it would be commencing uh, unconventional monetary policy, that's UMP, in the form of quantitative easing, 
Uh, by that I mean they're literally electronically creating uh, billions of new dollars and using them to purchase government bonds and park them on their balance sheet. The idea being, um, because governments are having to issue a lot more new bonds to finance the big budget deficits because of the fiscal stimulus for COVID, uh, if that would make, result in a significant increase in the supply of bonds, meaning <clears throat> their price would go down or the yield would go up. So the RBA, like the Fed, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, European Central Bank and the Bank of England, are all uh, furiously purchasing bonds and parking them on the balance sheet to keep the price of the bonds high or the yield on them low. So the RBA have come out with a target. They've said they will just purchase whatever it takes, the volume, whatever, whatever volume it takes of uh, three-year government bonds to keep their yields around 0.25% per annum. And you can see from the inset from that there, uh, the little yellow line there, they've been pretty successful in that. They're not trying to keep them exactly 0.25%, uh, but uh, certainly close to it. And while they've purchased, you know, they were purchasing several billion dollars a week in the early stages of the um, unconventional monetary policy, they've now been able to back that off. And so far, at least up to now, uh, they've been able to, to keep that, that going. Uh, Nevertheless, as and when there are going to be times because the AIFM, the Australian Office of Funds Management, on behalf of the federal government, are issuing uh, you know, several billion dollars of new bonds every week, uh, and uh, the RBA may well have to come in to purchase some more of those bonds uh, going forward to, as I say, to keep the price of them up, which is the same thing as keeping the yield of them down. Um, that's three-year government bond yields. That, the reason I put that is because that's, that's what the target is. But the big one further out, the yield curve, 10-year government bond yields. Next chart, please, Richard. Thank you. Uh, they also are at historical lows, uh, in part because of the, uh, the um, ultra-loose monetary policy. But what where this also gets interesting is how it relates to the Australian dollar. Now, I will talk you through this. So uh, the inset there the, is that yellow line there on a daily basis, uh, red to the left chart, against the Australian dollar's value for the US dollar against the uh, purple line, red to the right scale. Now, it was totally not coincidental that when the 10-year bond yields were rising steeply from the 9th of March, uh, also, the Australian dollar was falling uh, ste as steeply. The reason for that is because foreign, foreigners own about 70, or at a peak, about 70%, 70% of Australia's government bonds. Uh, that's more, it's, it's uh, more like 50% at the moment. And they were aggressive sellers of Australian bonds in uh, March this year. And when they sell their Australian bonds, uh, which pushes the price uh, pushes the price down or the yield up they also sell the Australian dollars that they purchased to purchase the bonds in the first place so the Australian dollar is under siege now Australia's leading export economy being WA uh, will always do better when the Australian dollar is lower rather than higher but you don't want too much of a good thing when it falls from 67 cents to 56 cents in a matter of a couple of weeks that's not in anybody's interest uh, much better to have a steady, slow and steady um, depreciation. <laughs> Excuse me, not only is uh, WA's exporters, but the state government uh, is, the state budget is um, sensitive to the tune of 122 million Australian dollars for every one cent change in the, one cent fall in the Australian dollars uh, exchange rate for the US dollar. And that's because all those big, uh, the, the iron ore royalties, all those written in US dollars, and the state government gets more Australian dollars when the Australian dollar is depreciating. And that's what was happening, uh, but it was too much too quickly. So the Fed, sorry, the RBA had to step in with aggressive uh, purchasing of 10 year government bonds as well, uh, and they have successfully brought them down and they've been pretty stable, although earlier this month there was a bit of spike in 10 year government bond yields. Um, 
but it has caused the, they've probably been a little bit too successful from WA perspective and WA government's perspective in now the Australian dollar did breach 70 US cents recently. Much better if it had sort of gone back to sort of 60, about 65 and stayed there, uh, we would have been very happy, but it's gone up to 70 in part because the US dollar uh, has, uh, has come off the boil. Not a lot we can do about the value of the Australian dollar, uh, other than to hope that it stays low and stable uh, because um, it's always going to be good, good for the, um, the WA economy and particularly the WA government's uh, coffers. Uh, and next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> Donald Trump can bang on all he likes about, about you know, America losing its clout in the world. Uh, believe me, they, they, their capital markets still punch well and truly above their weight division in terms of their impact on uh, other uh, capital markets. Um, we all know that if the Dow, you know, loses 1,000 points tonight, that the all odds will open, you know, very sharply lower tomorrow morning. No different in the bond markets. Hundreds, literally hundreds, if not thousands of days in the 31 years I've been at Bank West, I've dealt with a significant movement in bond yields, not because of any domestic data, but purely because of what's happening in the U happened in the US the previous night. So, uh, for, for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse, rightly or wrongly, uh, depending on what happens in the US uh, bond market will significantly impact <laughs> the Australian market. Um, Richard, I've got a couple of slides on equities, but I don't want to give Peter Speechley a heart attack. So um, I might just, um, we'll, we're going to give it to him anyway, are we? Yeah. Um, I might sort of say, have you got some questions for me? Because if you haven't, well, I will give Peter Speechley a heart attack, but if you have, I'll uh, perhaps deal with them. No, there's no questions, Alan, so you can continue. Right. <clears throat> uh, okay, but yes, um, you might remember the, uh, steep precipitous um, correction in equity markets started on the 20th of this uh, 20th February this year. What, I, what I've done is just put it against what happened during the GFC. Um, basically I took it to 10 days before the, uh, the peak. So um, the GFC is on the left one and it's the number of days since the peak. Uh, so it took about 120 trading days for the equity markets to bottom. Uh, I can see a question down there. We'll come to that in a minute. Took about 120 days, uh, the, and then before it started to rise in March 2009. Um, this time, the it took uh, 20 days to fall by a lot more than it did in the first 20 days during the GFC, but it's recovered really quickly. And again, that's because of our dear friend. The next chart, please, Richard, which is the last one. I promise. The, uh, the Dow. Now, um, the, I've got the Dow every day uh, since 1896. And what I did here was the great the crash, stock market crash of 1929. At this time, I took it to 20 days before the peak. <coughs> and and COVID-19 was uh, every bit as, um, as uh, steep and as sharp as it was during the immediate aftermath of the stock market crash in 1929, but it has rebounded really quickly. I suppose the warning I'll make there is there was also a big rebound between November 29 and May 1930. Now, totally different this time. Uh, the you know, Basically, the Fed, the US Federal Reserve, uh, um, tightened monetary policy was this time there flooding the market with liquidity. Uh, we all learned, all central banks have learned the lesson of the Great Depression. Uh, <clears throat> but equally, they weren't dealing with a pandemic uh, back then because um, Spanish flu had been well and truly uh, con uh, brought under control by this time. Uh, so I I'm just a little concerned that US equity markets have got a little bit ahead of themselves and are not perhaps, um, by the way, this is up to two nights, doesn't in incorporate last night's uh, pullback a little bit. Um, but yeah, look, a big issue for us as a capital intensive economy is what happens on Wall Street. And uh, I suspect that if there is another uh, significant correction, it won't be as bad in Australia because we didn't go up as far in the first place. Uh, but you can't sort of, as I say, 
that the US capital markets still punch well above their weight division, and they will be until China is prepared to open their capital markets. The US dollar will remain the benchmark um, global um, reserve currency until China allows the one to, to you know, opens its capital markets to the rest of the world, which is probably some time away. Uh, so the US is still going to, going to dominate. So we're very much uh, looking at what happens in in global uh, equity markets. <laughs> it's probably the first thing I look at each morning, obviously what's happening on Wall Street overnight, then the iron ore price, you know, gold price, et cetera, et cetera, and oil prices as well. Uh, that is definitely my last slide, Richard. So let's mm -hmm. have that question. All righty. Ellen, what is your forecast for the gold price? Um, yeah, I'll look uh, in, in US dollar terms. Um, that's that one. Look, I'm, I'm pretty, um, I, mean, I don't forecast the gold price as such, but I'd be, you know, as I say, it had a good um, GFC. And if there's another equity correction, which I think is probably more likely than not, uh, probably the gold price will, will do okay out of it. So um, uh, I'm, you know, the old sort of disclaimer, I'm literally am not licensed as a financial planner, so I can't give that advice. Um, but yeah, I, it, it's, a, it's a good thing that WA has some exposure to it, um, to at, at least somehow sort of offset the, our vulnerability to the iron ore price and LNG prices. Okay, great. Thank you, Alan. That's it for uh, the questions. I'm just going to invite Litza back on screen. Alan, we've, we've just received one more question. Yeah, I saw that. Has the government overstimulated? <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, a, a good question is firstly, uh, they've got a big decision to make on how quickly they reduce job keeper and to what extent they reduce lower job seeker because you've got to be really careful that the economy doesn't fall off a cliff on 20th of September when those things are due to sort of go back to normal uh, because you know clearly yes we're opening up the economy more so in WA and hopefully we don't have to reclose it but you know clearly it's a long time before you know big crowds are going to be at footy games in melbourne uh we're told there's going to be sixty thousand in at, down at perth stadium next month with the with the derby that's great but that's compared to the rest of australia you know they're going to be very careful uh as we see so it's going to be and then you're also getting a lag effect you know just Qantas today putting off a lot of people and retiring six of their remaining seven 747s because they don't know when the Overseas borders are going to reopen to people movement, and um, you know we have no idea when the next uh, cruise ship with cashed up foreigners is going to come into Fremantle or Broome or any port in Australia. Uh, so, you know, the economy isn't just going to snap back as, as the was the hope. Um, I think probably, if anything, um, the government's going to have to keep that stimulus up. That's going to be uh, put a lot of onus on the RBA to keep purchasing bonds to soak up that extra supply to keep the price up or keep the yield down um, because clearly the economy cannot could not handle um, a significant rise in interest rates at the moment um, but yeah look I, I, I'm just I'm just like I'm happy to die wondering what might have happened had governments not um, you know come in with significant fiscal stimulus during the GFC uh, you know, had they not done that this time because of the pandemic and still need to do, um, it could have been, you know, very ugly. It still might be, but, um, no, there's a, there's a place for significant fiscal stimulus. Uh, but equally then we're going to have to come up with some significant, you know, tax reform to pay for it all down the track. But that's, you know, you need to concentrate on the here and now at the moment, um, limiting as much as possible the impact of the COVID lockdowns on the economy. 
I think that's uh, it for time, Alan. Um, it's been wonderful to have you present today, particularly in such a turbulent uh, time for our local and national economy. No doubt it's been highly informative to our attendees. On behalf of myself and the partners and the staff of HLB Manjad, wish you all the best for your retirement. You're yeah. lucky, I wish I was there with you. Um, for our audience members, thank you very much for your time. If you have any further questions, please submit them directly to HLB at hlbwa.com.au. We look forward to chatting with you again and many thanks for attending at the seminar today. Thank you. Thank you.